Hopi, let's start off on a positive note because we got some negative stuff to weed through on our way to our guest this week. Shout out to our boy, Mo, Steve Molaski, former guest here on OHL Stories, had some great stories to share during his appearance earlier this year. Takes the time out of his busy day to send us a happy new year message. So wasn't that a nice to, email to get? It, so nice to get. Hey. Note to selves, Farwell and Pope at gmail.com. Anytime you want to reach out, tell us what you think of the pod. Tell us what you think of our hairline. Tell us what you think of the pandemic pounds we've put on. Tell us a guest you want to hear. Maybe Steve Molaski and or somebody else like him. But yeah, it was nice for Mo just to take a moment to send a happy new year note. Took me back to the conversation we had with him. It was lots of fun. He was a great guest. And hey, Mo, on the podcast now too. Happy New Year, buddy. Yeah, Happy New Year to everybody. <laughs> and thanks for listening. Um, shout out to Pat, who sent us an email. Uh, we're working on that. Thank you very much. Appreciate that as well. And uh, it is nice to have some happy news. Uh, you mentioned Mo, former Cornwall Royal. Do you want to take your time now, Farzi? Or? Bring back the Royals. Listen, I'll take any guest that used to play for Cornwall and will join my bandwagon to bring that team back. Let's go. Let's go. Mo actually went on to play at RMC, was the first player to ever get his jersey retired at RMC, and uh, just a great, great man, and it was awesome talking to him. That it was, and you got to have a lot of respect for guys like that. I know we did, and that's what made it fun. And, of course, the, the negative stuff that we have to get into is around this COVID thing. I guess we could put the positive spin on it, and I, I've been in my sure. mind thinking of a positive spin, too. Well, yeah. the positive spin is this, thinking. Chris. Okay. The positive spin, in my opinion, is this. Though for the next several weeks, there won't be fans in the stands, the league is going to continue playing. And I know it's easier for me to say because it's not my money that's on the line, and this will be very difficult for a whole lot of teams in the OHL. But as I was thinking about this episode of our podcast and I was trying to get myself into the mindset for it, I thought the point I want to make is this we could talk about COVID for another hour if we wanted to. Everybody's got a theory on it. Everybody's got a feeling on it. Everybody I know is exhausted completely by it. But when it comes to COVID in the Ontario Hockey League and the decision that the league and its board of governors were facing just this week, what are we going to do? Are we going to shut down like the queue did? It's taking a longer Christmas break, for example. What are we going to do? Are we going to shorten the schedule? I thought to myself, you know what we need to do? We need to focus on the kids and forgive me for calling them kids, but let's be honest. These are 16 to 20 year old young men playing in the league, certainly kids to somebody my age, but it is so important that these kids get the opportunity to do what means so much to them. What matters these it's essentially, if you were to have to shut down, even for a certain period of time, again, you're depriving these kids of this continued opportunity to develop into the professional hockey players they would like to become, to continue developing as even players that might go on with an education package in the CIS or something like that. Whatever the case may be, they lost an entire year of development towards their future career, and they lost the year of being with their teammates, just like we talk about kids in school and the socialization. So I thought if we put our focus on the kids, what would be the best thing to do? And I think one of the best things to do is, look, these are all healthy young men. They're all vaccinated young men. Let's let them get out there. Let's let them play the games. Let's focus on their well-being mentally. We'll watch it physically with COVID protocols. Let's move on with this. I think the league has done a great thing here. I agree to an extent. Um, I think playing the games is probably the right way. I would have liked to see them take a break after Christmas, like we had talked about, take a pause, and come up with a plan and just be forthcoming with what's going on and make your decision, weigh your pros and cons and make that decision, not have three meetings in the second or first week of January, wondering what you should do on Monday. Like it it seems like, and I know it's ever changing. I completely understand that, but it seems almost like the league is being run by our provincial government. They can't figure crap out right now. And they're doing it all at the last minute. Regardless, I'm all for playing these games and the owners taking a hit on ticket sales for the next three weeks, because we've sat here and maybe you can help me out with this Farzi. You're, you're a little bit smarter than I am. Um, We talked about, you already mentioned it and alluded to it, that 
it's going to be really tough for some of these OHL teams. Is it? How many are community owned? Kitchener and who else? Is there one or two others? I don't. I thought Kitchener was the only community owned. Am I am I off base on that? I think everybody else has got a private owner. Do they? Okay. I think so. A few years ago, it was more than a few years ago, 2006, when the Windsor Spitfires were bought by Bob Bugner and Warren Reichel. Do you remember what the price tag was? I want to say six million, Bingo. but I could be see wrong. that's okay. why you're smarter yeah. than me. You're <laughs> brain like an elephant. Six sheets. What do you think when they just did the restructuring and a few new owners came into Windsor? What do you think the price tag was there? It when was it sold north... for six million in tw- 2006. Yeah, it was north of 10. Yeah. Warren and Bob made some money on their little investment. Yeah, and it, well, for them, that is little money, just for yeah. the record. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they had good careers. This, the, the Gulf Storm just sold. What do you think Scott Walker walked away with? Tony well, Saxon was calling it between t- at least 10, upwards of 15. Yes, I was paying very close attention because I'm always curious about these exactly. things. For sure, yeah. So I'm done talking about, oh, it's tough for these OHL teams. Your team is worth $15 million. You can afford eight games without fans in the stands, can you not? Well, it, it's, a, it's a loss leader for a lot of these owners. They, you, they, they don't care that they lose money. That's, that's an interesting point. For a lot, not because I've been, as you're talking, I'm running through my head trying to figure out if there is another community owned team. You know, you make a good point because I'm thinking of, of some of the guys that we know. Obviously, uh, one of the first that comes to mind uh, is, is our North friend in, in Erie. Oh. Um, uh, Waters. I was blanking on Waters, but he's yeah. a former radio executive. We know from the Chum Empire, lots of money there. Great example with Scott Abbott up in North Bay, of course, the Trivial Pursuit game net instead of a magnet. Uh, anyway, magnate. Yeah, he's got tons of money. Uh, Dario up in Sudbury has tons, tons of, of money. money. We we know the new ownership in. in I'll tell you right now, Flint's obviously. fine. <laughs> yes, th- th- Flint's that's fine. right. Because <laughs> Rolf had apparently NHL money settled for the uh, Ontario Hockey League. I know in, in Kingston, the ownership is is not holding any tag days. Same with Ottawa, although I still think, especially because of that, the 67s are kind of like the forgotten stepchild up there, but that's a whole other story. It's a really good point. My mind always goes to uh, the Owen Sound attack, Yes, which uh, for obvious reasons, right? Smallest market and about as close a thing as I think you'd get to community owned. But those that, that group that has owned that team has been nothing but committed and you know, to the franchise and keeping it there and, and serving the community with it. I, I don't know when, when they open the books, if they ever open the books on this and you get a chance to take a look at the finances of these Ontario hockey league teams, maybe they are lost leaders for, for most. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought of it that way. I was, I stole it. Cause I was having a conversation with a buddy earlier this week and he brought it up and I was like, Ooh, I'm going to bring that up on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> smart <laughs> like, friends, right? You got smart friends. Yeah. Exactly. But you look at like, Let's say 3,500 people. Is that an average OHL attendance, would you say? Uh, that's probably a little bit high, but I understand that's pretty close to the break-even mark, too. You want 3,000 to 3,500 to, to make your money every year. Yeah, and I'm saying $25 a ticket, roughly? Yeah, average? 20, 25 bucks, yeah. That's over $87,000 a game. Yeah, but, okay, but you're... You got to look on the expense side of the ledger here too. A thousand percent. But I'm just pointing out that yes, there's lots of expenses, but so so what expenses you're you're still going to have your bus trips. You're still going to have your hotels. You're still going to have the education packages. Right. So the education packages are huge. And I can tell you right now that $80,000 give or take can be roughly your baseline for sticks for a season. So one game based on those numbers, if you're right. You yeah. only got 33, 33 more pulver. Well, I, I'm just saying, so let's say each team loses three weeks, let's say six games, probably okay. a decent number. Yeah. Rain man, 80, 80, <laughs> 87 about, about times six. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I, I just think exact. on the large scale of things, is it really that much of a hit to the majority of the teams in this league if no fans are in the stands for – six home games. I don't know if it is. Yeah. And, and by the way, I was going three for some reason, six, six times 87. You're getting, you're getting up there. You're over half a mil. 
Well, yeah, I, I'm just throwing out six games. Like, I don't know. I figured two home right. games a week. Obviously, that's not the case because you're not going to have two home games every week. But I don't know. I just think the, the, the price tag on a franchise in this league, and we're worried about whether they're getting their fans in the stands for, let's call it, four home games. Yeah, I, I, I hear where you're coming from. And it, I think it, that's probably why the owners didn't want to shut down the season, right? Because they're like, let's just play. Let's get it going. We don't want to shut down and lose all the money. Because if you shut down now and this this thing all of a sudden gets extended from three weeks to six weeks to eight weeks, then what are you going to do? Well, and don't forget, this is something it has been a bit of a theme through our podcasts already this season. We've seen the attendance numbers, Popper. We're not going into the Eastern Whoa. Conference, but we're certainly seeing in the West. We're used to seeing 6,000 plus at the Memorial Auditorium. We've broken 5,000 twice. I know COVID plays a part in that, but as you and I have talked about, you go away for an entire year and it is possible that people find other things to do with their time. So staying current, staying relevant would matter for sure. Absolutely. And I think it, it's great for the radio broadcasters out there. More ears on the game. Everyone make it. sure to tune in Friday. <laughs> yeah, you can get, by the way, City News uh, 570 anywhere online, the Radio Player Canada app. Check it out. Tune in that way. You'll, you'll love it. You will not be disappointed. Right? If nothing else, you'll get, some, you'll get some witty banter. <laughs> Mate, <laughs> what show are they listening to? Ours. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, did you see all the trades go down today, Mike? I got to tell you, Chris, that the number of trades that went down today. I'm done talking about COVID. Sorry. I just. Yeah. No, I think, well, we, we've covered the bases, right? Exactly. And we'll talk to you when you're back in the yeah. rinks and, and we'll look forward to that day because hopefully that means we're done talking about COVID for almost ever. But when it comes to trades, and this, of course, is our last podcast before the trade deadline, which is Monday, the, the 10th of January, as it always is. But the number of trades that happened just today is more than I thought might happen this entire deadline. So kudos to the general managers and the owners that are saying, hey, we've got a shot here. We're going to go for it. I really thought, and I, I still think we'll, we'll focus on, uh, the big names that are yet to go that we're pretty sure will, Mason McTavish and Arb Jackye. But, you know, Nick Porco, Grayson Ladd, a former first rounder to the Kitchener Rangers, now up in North Bay. So the, the Spitfires are, are doing some things. I, I don't mind uh, London's acquisition of Cameron Baber from Saginaw. We know the spirit, of course, aren't going to be making a whole lot of noise this season. But yeah, the number of trades that have already happened. Boy, Niagara looks like it's in full on sellout mode. Uh, we'll, we'll see who else has decided that they are not going to be at the dance party come April. Yeah. Three moves today from Windsor. There's a lot of people in Windsor that um, have said that Bill Bowler's quiet and he doesn't like to make moves and he's conservative. Of course, I think anybody's conservative when your former general manager was Bundy, but, <laughs> <laughs> and here, here he is making, you know, three trades five days before the deadline. And you look at some of the trades that he's made and I don't think he's done. Um, so it's going to be a, Windsor was that preseason sweetheart around the league that many people had circled as a team that would contend for an OHL championship this year. And I don't think they had this first half of the season that they probably would have wanted. It took them a little while to get going under Mark Savard. Um, but I don't think Bill Bowler's taken his foot off the pedal by any means. Well, and think of a couple to a few of the reasons for that. The biggest reason, of course, Sean Luke Foody not returned to the Ontario Hockey League. So Windsor, one of those teams, and I know, I know there were others that felt the sting of that goofiness with the, with the rule, right? So John Luke Foodie's playing in the AHL. Xavier Medina was in and out, and, and he's obviously, we've seen him a couple of times now in recent weeks, and you can tell what an important piece to that Windsor lineup is. And Wyatt Johnston currently is playing like a man possessed. So that team also, with Bowler making these moves now, let's not forget, had they not run into real COVID issues when we, the last game we did was a game between Kitchener and Windsor. The Spitz had been rolling with points in eight in a row, six straight victories after two overtime losses. And had it not been for the COVID protocols, I think it would have been a, you know, a much different game. It was a well-played game both ways, but the Spitz certainly ran out of gas with a short bench towards the end of it. And some guys that were called into service at the, you know, in a sort of emergency type situation. So they were already starting to round into form. And I think Bill Bowler realizes that, okay, you know, we are what we thought we might've been at the beginning of the season. And I need to shore some things up. I also don't mind. Well, first of all, I just want to point out, I think Andrew Parrott to Windsor is just a fantastic trait by Bill Bowler. They get him from Owen Sound for a second 
two thirds and a sixth. It's a pre- hefty price for a rental because he's done after this year as an overager, but I just love him on that back end. You put him with a guy like Dano and oh, man, they're both fast. They can move the puck. They're physical. I, I just love that move. Grayson Ladd, as you mentioned, goes up to North Bay and you look at North Bay, a team that struggled lately, three wins in their last 10, I think. Um, but was up around the top of the Eastern Conference there for a while. And Adam Dennis goes out and gets a guy like Grayson Ladd to shore up his back end and a big Kyle McDonald up front. Imagine Kyle McDonald playing in that North Bay Gardens. No, thanks. And then they <laughs> add, add to the front uh, with Nikita Tarasavich at Asarnia. So I like the moves Adam Dennis is making. And he's taking a look at his team and thinks this, is, this may be our year with the way the East is turning out. Yeah, and you've already got Brandon Coe. How can you yeah. forget? You know, you can't talk about North Bay without talking about Coe in the season he is having in his OA swan song through this league. So the the addition there of Ladd now really making the overage situation in, in North Bay that much more cluttered because I've, I've, I'm counting four uh, on the roster right now. That really dampens my ideas of Arbor Jack guy ending up in North Bay because the Rangers and Battalion have been uh, known trading partners over the years. So it remains to be seen. And I, I have to say too, I'll just be perfectly honest about it. It pains me a little bit to talk about Arbor Jack guy and, and a potential trade from the Kitchener Rangers, because when you cover a team as closely as we do, when you're the broadcaster for that team, you get to, to know these kids, but I would be really surprised if he's not moved by Mike McKenzie to recoup some assets in a season that the Rangers probably didn't even intend on going all that far next year seems to be shaping up as that year. Anyway, it's hard when you're so close to the kid. Uh, it's certainly not a slight, you know, he'll bring back a good return, but I thought North Bay might've been a landing place for Arbor Jack. I, so we'll see where he ends up. You mentioned co 55 points. Can't mention co without mentioning Matt Bay Petrov who has 52 points second in the league. So Adam Dennis taking a look at the Christmas break and looking that he's got the top two scorers in the league probably might be the year that you you know, push some chips into the middle of the table and make some decisions. And he's obviously, when you go out and get a big guy like McDonald, that that's a big body up front and grace and lot overage, a good puck mover, really good skater. I like the moves that he's making up there too. And obviously he's making a push for that top spot in the Eastern conference, but you, you mentioned Jack. I, there's no doubt in my mind far as that he's being shipped out of Kitchener. And I think he could be one of the big pieces, I think for a team, that could push them over the edge. You know how playoff hockey is. Those types of defensemen are so valuable playing big minutes, five on five power play penalty kill, and no one's going to push a team around with him on the ice. So I, I, there's not a, I can't imagine Mike McKenzie holds onto him in Kitchener because he does need to recoup some of those picks. Um, I'm going to hate to see him go because I love the way his game has turned out from when he first came into this league. Uh, But whoever gets him, I think is going on a deep run for sure. Well, even before North Bay popped into my head, I was I was thinking that, boy, there's a lot to like from Arbor's perspective, really, uh, about a, a trade to Hamilton. Yeah. I mean, we, we, could, we could list off the reasons there. Not only is it close to the old home base for Arbor Jack Eye, but Jay McKee there is the head coach who would know an awful lot about him. You know, Andreas Carlson and his power play. We've seen Arbor Jack Eye in the power play in Kitchener and what he means to it now. And I think it'd be a real nice fit there, but... Anyway, I'm, I'm not getting into any of that. I'm not going to claim to have any insider information, but when I first thought about, you know, Arbor Jack, I no longer being a kitchen arranger and having seen the Hamilton Bulldogs play a game, I thought, you know, you know, who wouldn't look terrible on that blue line with some guys that are, I, I love Nathan Steos as it is. I think he's a, a tremendous piece on the back end for that club, but Arbor, I, we know he's going to improve any club and it'll be a loss for the Rangers, but they'll get those assets that they need. The other big name naturally is Mason McTavish. Everybody had him penciled into London as soon as he was returned to this Ontario Hockey League. I'm not sure that has changed to this point. I saw, I don't know who tweeted it the other day, but I saw a tweet recently yesterday or maybe today that said that they're not shopping Mason McTavish. That can't be the truth. I swear that's what it said. And it came out of Peterborough. In my mind, smart marketing. Yeah, we're not shopping them. <laughs> Everyone's calling us. We're not shopping them. We have 19 other teams giving us a ring right now. Right? I, I don't know. I don't put too much in. I just want to go back real quick yeah. to, Arbor, to Arbor Jack guy. Because there is a team in the Western Conference in the top two spots with only one overager on their team. There is, say that again. There is a top team in the Western Conference who is leading okay. the division 
with only one overager on their team. Would you oh, dare? No, no, it's not good. Stop it. No, it is not the London no. Knights. They have three. Now. I know it's not, it doesn't matter. It, no, it's not going to happen. It, there's no Why? way. George did, H-E George did hockey. Mike a favor a couple years ago when he traded him Giovanni Smith. That was the first time, by yeah, the way, we yeah. saw the trade between the two teams. Robbie, Robbie Fabry, Fabry does, does not count, does not count. Neither does Denver Manderson. Let's move on. Robbie Fabry counts. Do you <laughs> trade Arbor Jacki? to Guelph where he is public enemy numero uno. No, not unless George is personally bringing a Brinks truck to 1963 Eugene, Eugene George way in Kitchener and backing it up to the dressing room door. There's not, no, that, that will never happen. No. Nice try. Good one. Just saying Good one. And by the okay. way, you made me just with your Mason McTavish point. I just had yeah. to like, they're not even close right now. The, I, oh, the I piece. So I, I, I had to double check the standings thinking I, you know, lost a little bit of a brain cell or two over Christmas, but no, it's going to, it's going to be one of those whenever he gets dealt GM comes out and says, you know what? They just made an offer that we couldn't say no to. And, you know, okay. we wanted him to be successful and have a chance at an OHL championship PS. Thanks for the seven picks. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, you know, anyway, I just, I think Jack guy in Guelph makes a lot of sense. Look, I, I love where you're going with the, the story. Like, that would be an awesome OHL story. And, in fact, maybe we'll devote the entire podcast next week to uh, the story of Arbor Jacki being traded to Guelph. But just just stop with your nonsense, just, Pope. Just pointing it out. You're just hoping for the story, pal. Well, I just I think it makes too much sense. But, I, obviously, Kitchener and Guelph, you probably don't want them to trade within conference and within division. I get all that. But I just think. Admit it. You it don't hate the Hamilton sense. idea. No, I don't. It's also just less sexy to me because I won't get to see him play. Like I I just (laughs) truly enjoy watching his game. (laughs) Right. When you, when you trade a player like that, isn't that kind of the point? Yeah. You don't want to watch him play anymore. I know, but I'm not the general manager. So I'm being selfish. I don't, right. Like if I'm Mike McKenzie, of course I don't want to trade him to Guelph, but I, I don't mind the Hamilton the Hamilton talk for sure. They, they have three OAs right now though. Well, so you'd have and, to get one back. Well, you know, and one back OA for OA. Could be, could be you, uh, you know, you take a guy that'll maybe, you know, help you get over the top or really push in that conference. You give us a guy that keeps us stable while we have a, you know, a pretty young team and and that blue line in Kitchener too. I mean, we talked about with John Luke foodie, the, the absence of Donovan Sabrango was a, an unexpected blow to the Rangers roster this year. Right. I mean, unexpected in so far as when you're looking at it on paper years ago, Donovan Sabrango was still a part of your team. Yeah. And I think for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was was stay. You had mentioned Steos, and then they have Colton camera on the back end and Navrin mutter up front. His mother was a mutter. Well, yeah. And you know what, when you've got a, when you've got a mutter on your team, uh, you know, that, that might make a, uh, a Jack guy irrelevant as There's much no as you could say that about a guy like that. Yeah. 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 I, if, but if you got a mutter and a Jack guy, one up front, <laughs> one on the back end. Yeah. That's a, oh, that's a dangerous combo. It's a Fun dangerous combo. combo. It would be. It's almost it as be. if, yeah. It's almost as if the Bulldogs would have, um, a way of pulling in the Hamilton people into that team because Hamilton is a rough and tough city and they like rough and tough players anyway i will just i will just say again that i'm i'm glad to see the teams making this as interesting as they are in in terms of the trade deadline because i honestly thought we were going to have crickets this year how do you how do you determine if you're out of this at this point we are not even halfway we're barely a third of the way into the season so it's a dangerous uh, time man oh is it's a dangerous time like it's yeah you know russian roulette really Spring you know, is going to be awesome. Are, are you going to pull this, that trigger? Is there a bullet in the chamber? Who knows? Yeah. This nonsense will all be behind us by spring. We'll, we'll have forgotten about the talk about shortening schedules and taking breaks and, and hospitalizations due to COVID-19. And we're just going to be raring up for playoffs. And it, it should be, it should be a, as much fun in this league as it always is come the last couple of weeks of the season in the playoffs. I really respect your optimism. I really do. <laughs> Come on, Pope. I need more of me? it. I'm telling you, I need more okay. of it right now. I need more yeah. of it. I'm just, 
playing devil's advocate, you know, nothing seems to be going right this past year. So it's like, uh, let's hope. Nothing could possibly go worse. Dare I say that? Did I just put it out there into the universe? Yes, you did. Okay. Um, But yeah, hopefully uh, come spring, we don't have to talk about any of this and there's full arenas everywhere and players are on the ice having fun and you and, and I are sitting in the press box singing kumbaya exactly and and the hosts of this year's memorial cup will be gearing up for a big event that not only celebrates the game but celebrates their city and their franchise and people will gather and they'll sing kumbaya and they'll quaff a few beers and they'll enjoy the major junior national showcase in this country i'd say that of course deliberately because of our guest this week and that showcase is in saint john this year our guest is the assistant coach for the saint john sea dogs but was once another dog a mississauga ice dog and then a niagara ice dog this guy loves his dogs every dog has his day (laughs) right (laughs) second rounder to the columbus blue jackets but became famous in canada after being the star attraction of Team Canada's World Junior Tournament when it was in Czechia, Stefan Legion won a gold medal despite injuring his shoulder on the first shift in that gold medal game. He retired from the game of hockey at 19, would come back to the American League signing with uh, Columbus's farm team just a few months later. We get the full story from a great character around the OHL, Stefan Legion. So, Stefan, I was curious as to a kid coming into the Ontario Hockey League being drafted by the Mississauga Ice Dogs back in the day. Now, I know your first year there was when the team really started tasting success, but let's be honest, from its inception, it had not tasted a lot of that success. Do you roll your eyes a little bit and say, oh, my God, I'm going to Mississauga? No, I actually uh, had one of those OHL sweetheart deals to go to Mississauga. Um, So I was pretty excited. I got to stay living at home. It wasn't that that was important to me, but when it presented itself as an option, I, you know, my home life was incredible. So I was happy to extend that. And I had a lot of familiar people and the owner at the time, Mario Forgione was living in Oakville and it just felt like a good fit. And when we talked and, you know, we, we made something work that I was going to end up there and I'm really glad I went. It was, it was an incredible three years and then you know, fourth year in, Miss, or in Niagara, sorry, but it was an incredible time in there. In Mississauga. You played as a 15 year old. I think the only other 15 on 15 year old on that team was Luca Caputi. What was it like in this league in your first season? It was hard. I mean, there were some big guys. My first game, I was lining up against Anthony Stewart. and He was 19 and he's just an enormous human. And, you know, it was big. The game wasn't as, as small and skilled and fast as it is now. It was, don't get me wrong, there were some good players I played with. Patrick O'Sullivan, there was a lot of skill there, but, you know, it was a lot of big, heavy, mean players still at the time. So it was, uh, it was daunting as, uh, you know, I was pretty small, five, I want to say I was five, nine, but maybe five, eight, barely 150 if, you know, so it was, it was tough a lot of nights going into some of the matchups that I had with big guys, but it was, uh, it was fun. I, I love competition. I love challenge. I love being smaller and, you know, trying to, be bigger than I am. So it was awesome every night at that age. Since Chris brought up the name, Luca Caputi, you ended up playing with him overseas as well. And now you're both in the coaching ranks in the CHL. Tell us a little bit about Luca and what you think of his prospects as a head coach. Yeah, he's great. I mean, he's, he's very detailed. He cares a lot about the game. He's passionate. Um, You know, I've, I've spent a lot of my, my hockey career attached with him. We, you know, we played junior for four years. We were drafted together. And then, like you said, we played together in Sweden. You know, it's, it's nice to see us kind of come full circle. And, you know, now we're having conversations that you never thought you'd have with somebody about, you know, four checks and line changes and all these different things that we really did not care about when we played together. It was just, how are we going to, you know, take a dump on these other guys tonight and get as many points as possible? So it's funny to see it kind of go to go that way with somebody that you started as a player with. And now you're kind of going through coaching together. And obviously for him, he got a, a great opportunity this year. He's doing really well with it. So, you know, it's, it's nice to see guys that you came up with doing well. Was there always a true friendship there? Cause you were at his wedding or was that something that just grew over time? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you're you're around somebody for so long, you just get to know them. And, you know, we kind of adapted to, you know, we were we had our times where we weren't always that that close and we we're different people. And, you know, I think hockey, as much as it's a team sport, it's a bit of a selfish game, too. Everyone's trying to be the best. Everyone's trying to get ahead especially in junior and the American league level, you just, you know, you're trying to become that next big thing. So there was times where we butted heads, but you know, we're, we're the same in that we're, we're both just hockey people. We we're passionate, we're competitive. And, you know, it's really nice. There haven't been many people that I've, I've stuck in touch with from my days in the OHL and Luke is one of them that I'm still in touch with. And it's nice that our careers are aligned now a little bit. I like the way you described those conversations you're having now, the kinds of conversations that when you were junior players, you never would have thought you were ever going to have, because who cares about that stuff when you're 16, <laughs> 17, you're, you're tucking 43 a year, that sort of thing, right? Do you, do you look back now, Stefan, and, and feel any remorse for what you did to coaches at any point in time? Yeah, it was, it was awful. Like awful. I would have, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't have survived in today's game with some of the antics that I was pulling. That's for sure. Um, you know, probably had some long nights for some coaches, particularly one at the end of my career, but um, yeah, it's tough. I think that's just what it is. Part of being a kid, you don't know what you're doing. You think, you know, everything you're, you're smart and you're not, but you know, everything I did then is, I think it's really paid dividends because it kind of directly reflects what I'm doing now. So you know, I got a lot of good, good life learning experience back then in terms of how to handle players and what they're going through when they're acting this way and a lot of that stuff. You mentioned that coach at the end of your career. Is he the one that gave you the nickname 50%? No, that was, uh, <laughs> that was a guy in pro. This was a guy at the end of my, I was pretty quiet at the end of my playing career. I, in junior, I was more of a outspoken coach's problem, a little <laughs> bit more so very opinionated that was more it and I thought again I thought I was right and you know, no one else could be right except me so that was my mentality back then and I, I you know what it's, it's wrong but I think it helped me accomplish some of the things I accomplished I had to play a role where I was kind of hated every night so like, why not everybody hate me <laughs> why the, why the other team why not everybody you you talk about the the experience you gain really in, in life and, and in hockey going through what you did that brings you into coaching. Now, how much of that do you draw on now as a coach with St. John? I think you're drawing on it every day. It's you're dealing with so many different kids at so many different stages of their life. And, you know, every year you're one day you're talking to a 16 year old and you're thinking back when you were 16 or 17 year old. And, you know, as your career progressed, you're talking to different guys at different stages. So, you're always kind of leaning back on what you know, but also not relying on it too much because no one's the same. Those kids aren't going through what I was going through and they don't want to just hear about what I was going through. So I think a lot of it is just, you know, being a listener and listening to what they have to say. And instead of just trying to instill what I think is right, you listen. And then when you can, you know, kind of throw in your expertise in the, in the area, that's when you can kind of really dive in. But I think a lot of talking goes on from people in authority and not much listening. So you can still talk, but you have to listen to figure out what you need to talk about. So, you know, like drawing on those experiences all the time for sure, but still trying to just, you know, adapt and, and stay current because the kids don't really care about what happened five minutes ago, let alone 15 years ago. So, you know, you got to remember that too. And everyone's selfish. They want to think about themselves. So you got to, you got to give these kids time to kind of lay it out and get it off their chest a little bit. In talking about coaching, it's the perfect segue because in your first year in the OHL, you play for Greg Gilbert, you run into him again in the pro ranks, and now he hires you out in St. John. What does that man mean to you? Yeah, he was a great mentor. He was, you know, for me as a player, it was, uh, <clears throat> it was something that I really attribute a lot of the success in my career to. A lot of the things that I was given, the Hockey Canada stuff, I think came from playing under him my first two years. Um, there wasn't much of an onus offensively put on myself. He didn't care if I had zero goals, 100 goals or anything. He wanted me to play a specific way, and I think he saw the bigger picture. So forever, I'm grateful. He spent a lot of time, you know, work. He used to drive me home from the rink, for Christ's sakes, after road trips because we both lived in Oakville. So, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of bonding 
quietly. I would never talk. God, it's like 16 year old me and Greg Gilbert sitting in a car at three in the morning. Like there wasn't many words said, but you know, there was a lot of just uh, a lot of information in the eyes driving home with Gibby and he'll always have a special place in my heart for what he did for me as a player. And it was nice to cross paths with him as a coach again, for sure. You talk about that hockey Canada stuff. So obviously that leads us to the opportunity with the world juniors in 08. Let's see, uh, Tavares, you already mentioned Stamkos, Subban, Legion, no big deal. Marshawn. You know, uh, Marshawn's on Mason. that team as well. Yeah. I mean, it just goes <laughs> on and on. Dowdy, Dowdy. was there. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. Decent squad. It, it makes me think, Stefan, about the pressure that we always talk about. We, the media, I think, always talk about is on you guys when you're there. You did win the gold, but can you can you put into words what, the, like, despite all those names, what the pressure is like to come back with the first place finish? Yeah, I mean, I kind of had this weird sense when I was there that there was more pressure to make the team. Canada was kind of on that hot streak. We'd won three in a row. So you just felt like if you made the team, you were going to win. So there was kind of that pressure, and I don't even want to say it was in camp. It was more in the, the Canada-Russia series that we played um, as, like, the summer camp. We did that eight-game summit series thing. I think they called it the Super Series. Um, so that was, like, the tryout for the World Juniors. So that's where I felt the most pressure. When I got to the actual camp, I felt good because I would established myself before um, – but it's great. Like, that's what you play for. Like you want the pressure. You want every play to matter, every shift to matter. Like, you know, it's the best of the best. And anytime you can be best on best, it's just, you know, there has to be that level of scrutiny and expectation and, and everything like that, because that's just what comes with the best. You know, I think the media is, is one thing, but I think it, it puts a, a nice emphasis on the importance of the players being their best because that's what the game's all about. So that's what was really fun about being involved with those players and those names. And I wasn't really one of those names when you look back at it, even then I wasn't one of those names, but to just compete with those guys and to, to play with them and to try to be mentioned with them, it was incredible. And I think, you know, the pressure is something that adds to that. And we won, so I didn't really have to think about the negative side of it, but, you know, just the pressure to win, it was, the dressing room, everything was electric. Like it was, everyone knew what everything meant and it was so, you know, intense and everything's on the line for two weeks. And it was just, it was like heaven. It was the greatest environment I've ever played in. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of those guys that were on the team have gone on. I think all of them have Stanley Cups pretty much, but, um, you know, and for them, it's, they've gone on to greater things, but, you know, for somebody like me, it's it's something that I'll never, never rival again. Even if I get there as a coach, I don't think there's anything like being a player on the ice during those best on best competitions. And you're wearing your country sweater and somebody else is wearing theirs. And it's about to be a war for 60 minutes to, to win the game. You're talking about all those other players, but, you know, anybody who watched that tournament, you were the guy everyone at home in Canada was talking about because of the style that you played and just how much fans loved watching this guy go out there and try to run over a guy that maybe six, four, two fifty in the corner. Um, but you ended up hurt, hurting your shoulder early in that final game. What was that like? Yeah, it was really, it's hard to say. It's, it's really disappointing. Like in the end, it doesn't matter. Like you really, I, when you go to that level, you bought into the team thing. So we won. So who cares if I played in the gold medal game or if I didn't like, what if I sat on the bench the whole time, just as a 13th forward, like, you know, I still would have been ecstatic. Like it was great. Like it was even better. Like, I don't know. It added to the whole, like it's the way the tournament went for me with the media stuff and the TSN. And I think it just cemented it. It was like predetermined destiny that I was made to get hurt. And, a sacrificial lamb early in the game. <laughs> but no, I, I don't know. I just, my experience was so unique in that way. Like during the gold medal game, I was in an ambulance going to the hospital and I ran into a door that didn't open with my shoulder and then got back to the rink for the third period to watch it in the video room in my gear. 
you know, tied my skates late because we were winning and then they scored and went into overtime. And then, you know, so it was, it would have been awesome to be on the ice, but that wasn't how it was done. And for me, it was perfect. It was, it's awesome. So that run from the dressing room to the ice is, I don't really remember it, but it was, I know it was great. You know, from, from that high watermark, and you talk about being one of the, those greatest moments of your playing career. Can you take us through what happens you know, less than two years or so later when you're 19 years old and you say, I'm retired, <laughs> I'm done. Yeah, I think, well, it's like that injury, I think really played into that. Cause when I got back from world juniors, now I wasn't playing, I wasn't doing anything. Well, I was doing something that's for sure, but it wasn't hockey. Um, so I kind of created this celebrity for myself. And then I came back into a world where now I'm not living at home and I'm 19. I'm going to bars regularly. I'm in a university town. I don't have any physical responsibility except to rehab my shoulder. So I can be as hungover as I need to be for that. So it just kind of, everything kind of unwound for me. And, you know, then the pressures of, trying to make the jump to the NHL and going to the American league and there's world championship stuff. And it was just a lot in a short period of time that, you know, kind of didn't go my way after everything kind of had gone my way and it all just clashed. And I think the two things came to a head and the stuff that didn't go my way outweighed what had. And I kind of lost track of what made me, me as a hockey player. It was just a couple months later that you, told Columbus that you were you wanted to come back and play what was the turning point that led you from you know not wanting anything to do with hockey to then making that decision to want to come back well it's I think it's not that I didn't want anything to do with hockey it's just I don't know what do you do I didn't know what yeah. to do I just you know I I made a knee-jerk reaction and then once you do it you're done like I couldn't just be like oh just kidding the, the, it was not like if it was one day, if it was six months, if it was six years, like the damage was done the first day I made the decision. And, you know, I think in that six months, I just kind of had to, I had to bring myself back up to where I could just be okay with not probably never being what I was going to be anymore. And so it was just a, it was a weird, it was a weird stretch of time. I, it was not that I didn't ever love hockey. I wanted to play it. I just, I could and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to live my life. I just got a bunch of money. I just, you know, started, I moved to the U.S. I got all, you know, it's, I didn't know what to do. And I just obviously didn't do it the right way. And it's unfortunate, but I mean, not the first guy, not the last. So what can you do? You coach in the queue. That's what you do. <laughs> How are you doing now though? Good? Everything good? Yeah, great. Everything's good. good. I got three kids. I got a good wife. Everything's great. But my life is good and it's been good. Yeah, it's been good for a while. Good. So that's nice, you know. I mean, good man. Everything could always be better. Like, you know, I could have a bigger house. I could have a better car. I could have a better job that pays me more money. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's where I'm at and I'm happy with it. I'm happy to be part of part of the hockey journey again. And, just like a player I'm you know I'm like a 19 year old in my fourth year coaching and I'm looking to go to the Mem Cup this year so you know it's it's good everything is exciting and I mean I'm looking forward to the future I think I think it's going to be good I'm putting in a lot of hard work so I think it's going to pay off it's a real success story though when, when we look at it in this way from retiring at 19 to being where you're at now back in the game on the brink of that Memorial Cup you just mentioned was there for lack of a better term, Stefan, a, a, a coming to Jesus moment for you along the way where you said, like, I got to I got I got to get my my stuff together here. I got to figure this out. It wasn't like one thing. I think it was every year. It just kind of slowly the uh, stroke was painted in the painting and I just started to see it more clearly. And, you know, it was I can't even remember the age, but, you know, when you're. 25 and you can't even get a job in the American league hardly anymore. You, you got to start figuring that something's wrong with you and not everybody else. And I think that's when I just started looking in the mirror at what was actually going on. And 
I think once I got out of hockey, it allowed me to actually do that because I wasn't around those people that I had constantly been pushing back against. And, you know, there was always the I'm right, you're wrong mentality with me for coaches. And so once I got away from that, I was able to just be like, okay, you're a dick. Like, <laughs> that's, the, that's the logistics of this whole situation. <laughs> <clears throat> and then from there it's it's once you realize that you just weren't good it's easy to it's easy to start coming back and you start putting good people in your life and start letting people that were good back in your life and things things can turn around quickly when you when you want them to how often in these four years of your coaching career thus far do you uh have you looked across to a player maybe saying something to you that and you just think this kid he's just a dick <laughs> Oh, every day. These kids are some. These kids are some different now. Not just the ones on our team. Like every kid is. I don't know. I'm sure they said it about us. You know, we're the. For this generation, they've taken it to a whole other level of accountability and uh, and just their their willingness to take criticism. It's incredible. They're so good at it. <laughs> I've had similar conversations with other coaches about yeah. that very thing. It doesn't sound too oh, surprising. Yeah. It's, no, it's, and that's the thing, you know, it's the kids on our team buggy at times, just like every kid bugs every coach at times. And I think really it's more so just the fact that we're around each other so often, uh, you know, we're in an atmosphere where we're, we're like a pro schedule and these are teenagers. They're not pros yet. They're not men. They're not as much as you try to treat them like that or act like they're, you know, grown ups and you know Sidney Crosby be like Sidney Crosby. They're not. They're they're just kids. They go to high school. Something like, what were we like in high? What's everyone like in high school? Like you're not, you're not, you're not the person you're going to be when you're 22, even 23, and then let alone even further down the road. So as much as they're they're a pain in the ass and they're full of themselves and they don't listen, you got to just you know they are what what the world is making everyone and just the way that we were made it's we're products of environment and this is their environment and we just have to get used to it and adapt because as you learn every year the, the coaches don't stay the players stay so you have to adapt to your players more than they have to adapt to you I think and it's kind of uncomfortable but it's uh it's the way it's going lately I think and it is what it is it's not always fun but it's always interesting. Going back to the OHL, just real quick. Um, I'm sure we have a bunch more on this, but when you were in uh, Mississauga, played with a defenseman who many people might know, um, Alex Petrangelo. When, when he first came, <laughs> when he first came into that into that league, did you know right away? Yeah, he was so good. Like I think it was just like his size too. Like. He wasn't a 60. He didn't look like a 16 year old with equipment on. So you were just, you never felt like he was 16 and he just didn't do things that like, it's really, I don't know. He was, he was good. Like it was, it was hard to, you know, hard to understand really like the, the level because you're cocky and you're like, ah, oh, he's not that fucking good. Like I'm good. He's not good. <laughs> But you just, you know, he was able to come into the league so young and you just, you were never like, oh, like, he's going to be good. You're just like, oh, wow, he's good. <laughs> there was never that. Like, you just never had that he's going to be good thing. It was just like right away from day one, he was just an elite hockey player. Like just even the way he handled himself in the dressing room, just quiet, professional, the way he plays, like just about his business, just – mature beyond his years and you know, the rest is what it is. But I mean, you couldn't tell that it was going to be that yeah. because I think, you know, to win those type of things that he's won, a lot of things have to come into place, but you knew that there was a very high ceiling if there even was one. And, you know, he keeps proving that there probably wasn't one. So it's exciting. You know, it's exciting to watch what he's doing and, you know, not that we're still close by any means. I, the last time I talked to him was Caputi's wedding, but you know, it's just as a coach now it's I'm coaching D in St. John. So it's hard not to admire what he does at the, that level. And, you know, that's what he did at our level too. He just, he dominated it. He was so good. 
you use that word elite and Chris alluded earlier to how much fun you were to watch as a player. You are also the fastest skater at the top prospects game. Where would you rank? Where would Stefan Legion rank today in that same I competition? I, still, I think I'd still be, oh, like if me now. Well, no, you, I mean, just take, take the fastest kid today against you oh, I'm when you were the fastest kid. Here. I would love to play now. Cause I wouldn't have to worry about the big lugs. Like I could just eat these small skill guys up. <laughs> you know, there wouldn't be the the heavyweight. There's only maybe one and one or two a team, but I wouldn't have to worry about them. I would love to play now. Oh baby. <laughs> would I love to play? I think I'd still be fast, be faster than anyone. Is anyone on St. John's faster than you right now? Or are you taking it's that crown if you guys did a I don't think I don't think anyone that's faster than me. It, but the, the fastest, I don't know. It, if we're doing that lap, I just know how to do that lap really well. I can cross over it well. It's just made for my stride. Now, now, is that something that you practice, or is that something from back in the day when you weren't so kind to the coaches that you had to do quite a few of those? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was. I think it was just something like my 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 stride fit that crossover that you need to do to get that, that continuous crossover coming around the net. I was just compact and fast enough that I could do it. Cause that's where you win or lose that lap yeah. is coming around the net. Anyone can go fast in a straight line. Like we're all strong, powerful, athletic humans. Like we can move fast in a straight line, but to be able to build speed come out, I think I was just, you know, my body was built for it. Not for any other things, but for that lap. <laughs> well, hey, when when the team moved to Niagara, I think you were built for that arena. When you walked into the old Jack, did you think? Oh gosh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that place was incredible. Like I loved every game that we played there. It was so fun. The room was awful, awful, awful under the stairs. Like it's fat, cut under the bleachers. Some guys didn't even have full stalls. Like. It was atrocious. In the winter, it was freezing. But, like, the game, like, the crowd was always right on top of you. The rink was just big enough that you had room to move, but just small enough that you could close on somebody fast. It was just a fun atmosphere. I don't know. It it was, uh, you know, the town, too, the way that the town is, I think. It's a real blue-collar place. And it was a blue-collar rink. And I played blue collar hockey I think and it was just a great fit like it would have been incredible to spend four years there but now that they got the new rink I've been back a few times and saw a game it's they did a great job with the size of it the fans are still right there and I just I love that city I mean it killed me but it would have been uh it would have been a nice time to spend four years there for sure kind of lost in that when we talk about the team moving is of course there was an ownership change is that on your radar at all as a player that the oh and did it you know did it disrupt anything in your life or is it just like nope i'm just gonna go play in a new building you know it disrupted a few things in my life <laughs> <laughs> but uh i mean you normally wouldn't think about it really like uh you know again like i haven't really looked at that situation as a whole and I'm the dick or not, but um, it's it's not really something you think about. It's for me, it was a big change because of the billet and moving away from home for the first time and everything like that. And I had, you know, I had pretty, you know, if you you know Forge Mario Forgione, the owner of Mississauga, he was pretty uh, pretty outlandish. And I don't know if that's a bad thing. I don't mean it in a bad way. He was a great guy, but he was, you know outspoken and always around and so I, had, I was comfortable with ownership I never had an issue that way and you know getting to Niagara it, there was some things I didn't agree with that were done but again I'm a player they're they're the team so who cares what I think but you know it, it just and I think there I was just trying to get bigger than my britches too you know I started to be successful and I just wanted to you know like an Aaron Rodgers of the OHL wanting to be part of making decisions in ownership and, and doing other things and 
you know, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't a good situation going to Niagara in any terms, but on the ice. The on ice was so pure, but the off ice was just so, so bad in every aspect. On the ice, you guys make a, a couple trades towards the deadline, but you guys went out and got Sebastian Dom, I remember. Did you, did you, did you guys expect to beat Oshawa in that second round? Yeah, if he would have stayed in the net. <laughs> I hope he's not I listening. Went to, I hope he is. <laughs> <clears throat> I should have went to Kitchener. I was supposed to go to Kitchener at the deadline. Really? But I was, Yeah, but I was at the World Juniors, and I just – honestly, I didn't want to think about it. Like, it was, again, like, just the OHL was like, I don't care. Like, it's – I'm at the world juniors. I'm not thinking about it. And then when I did start thinking about it, I was like, oh, I'm a pretty big superstar in Niagara. Like, what am I going to be in Kitchener? And, you know, I, I was still new to being good. I think like my first two years were pretty underwhelming. Like nobody ever wants to talk about those two. <laughs> we can. <laughs> No, but so I was kind of new to being good. So I just, I didn't, you know, some good players in Kitchener, Duco, Azevedo, Spalling, you know, Kadri. They were, I think Kadri was there, maybe. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were, they were stacked. Bodker was there. They were stacked. I'm like, where am I going to play on this team? Like, you know, and yet I probably would have played on one of the top lines. I would have played a lot in hindsight, but I was just comfortable in Niagara. I did whatever I wanted. I, acted however I wanted, although it was wrong. Um, I just was comfortable there, so I stayed. And then we thought we could win the East and go to the Mem Cup that way. And we traded for Dom, and the goalie is very important. And in our game, he just came out of the net and misplayed the puck twice in the game, and we got beat out. I think we would have beat Oshawa, no problem. And then who else? Belleville? Belleville, yeah. Yeah. He was they so good fine. when he got him, too. Yeah, he was unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. They're always unbelievable until you get them. I, I was going to say, I know we all know this, but Kitchener did something that year, just pointing it out. That was, oh, wait, they, they won. <laughs> yeah, they won the league. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, they did, won did, the league. They lost in the Mem Cup final to Spokane. Yeah. Do you ever look back and just think, Oh, Shit. So stupid. Yeah. <laughs> dumb. Dumb. They lost in the finals. Like I don't I was a point and at least a point and a half game player in the CHL. Like if I'm in the lineup, I'm getting a point and a half. Probably we're winning the game. Fuck. Like I, I think about this stuff sometimes. I try not to. <laughs> well, I'm hoping to get redemption on that. I actually just talked to Colin Campbell about that this summer. He was bringing it up. Because he's got the Kitchener ties. He was trying to get me to go there. and Yeah, I think about it. I do. I really do. It would have been nice. Play for Pete and Spotter. And, you know, anyone who plays for Pete and Spotter seems to have success later on in hockey. So, my path there would have been easier. But, once again, you only get one opportunity to make these stupid choices. <laughs> I, I'm curious because given what you've – been through and and somebody who has seen probably better than most the business side of the game how you are are more property than player when it comes to professional hockey what brought you back into the game it's just it's everything that i am really like i don't know anything else you know not that I was always like destined to be a great hockey player, but even just as a kid, I never did anything else. I never focused on anything else. I just, it's all that I was. Like I used to sit in my basement and tape my stick and then take the tape off and then tape it again. And like, it's just all I wanted to do. Like I would skip exams in grade nine and 10 to go play shinny. Like I just, I did, I didn't care about anything but hockey. And I still, I care about my family now. Like I have, three kids so to say that I don't care about anything is ignorant but I just it's everything I am like I love it I think about it like 24 hours a day I have to do things that aren't hockey I play a baseball video game because it's like the only thing that will get me away from not thinking about hockey like I just love it I can't 
I can't bring myself away from it. I retired for one year. And the first thing I thought of was like, how can I be involved in hockey? Like it's not a player because I love it. It's awesome. I think I just didn't like being a player. Like I just, I wasn't made to be told what to do. I wasn't made to work out that way. I wasn't made to be able to eat right and train for that long. And that just wasn't for me. So I'm, I really think that coaching is the path that I was destined for and I'm excited about it. It's, it's good. And like I said, it's just, it's all I know. It's all I've ever known. So it's all I want to do. You mentioned how much you love the game and obviously coaching, you watch a lot of film. Are you able still to watch NHL games without any sour grapes or anything? Oh yeah. All the time. Like, I have no, like, again, I, I'm pretty confident that, I did not make it because I wasn't good enough. So I can watch the game and I've made my bones with myself. So, you know, to watch guy like talk about Petro, like, you know, you talk about all the guys on that world junior team, like it was right there at one point, like there's no real sour grapes in it. And now it's just, you know, I love watching them and seeing what they do. And, you know, I think knowing them adds a little bit to the teachability with the, the players in junior, you know, to have any connection with NHL players, they seem to be really into that. So, um, you know, it's, it's good. I love, I love watching games. I would try to watch every goal every, the next day, as many condensed games as I can. I try to watch one in the background while I'm doing my work. Like it's, 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 you know, it's, it's where I want to be. So it's, it's what I want to do. It's, you know, I can't get there as a coach and then be like, Oh, I should have been a fucking player. <laughs> no, I, I gotta, I had to get over that part. And it's, I think it's hard for coaches to kind of turn the page on being a player. And, you know, there were some times early in my, when I was coaching him early in my career, four year career, but there was times earlier where people would joke and like, it's still a player. Eh? I like, still think you're a player. <laughs> so I think you have to kind of, to be a successful coach, I think you have to really let that part of your career go and, I'm more than happy to let go of being a player. You touched on it earlier when we were talking about the 08 season, when you were that close to maybe going to Kitchener. And then of course, hosting the Memorial cup would have had a chance to play in that final, but that opportunity for redemption this year in St. John, what's it been like in the city this year, knowing that you're going to host the Memorial cup in June? Oh, you can see the excitement through everyone's mask. I mean, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's tough I mean it's hard it's a really great time for our community it's something that you know hockey is a really passionate thing in St. John and the whole New Brunswick area and our ownership our group our owner is you know you got a lot of cash and he's putting a lot behind trying to make this a great event so it's really unfortunate that this pandemic is still going on and, and affecting that but I mean there's a lot more that's being affected than the Memorial Cup. So I don't want to sound like I'm uh, stepping on any toes because there is a, a pandemic going on. It's bigger than anything, uh, any one of us. But it would be nice if we could really kind of sink into that city environment and, and do this Mem Cup the way that it's normally done. Because I think St. John's a real good community for that. The way the city's set up, I don't know if you guys have ever been out here, but it's really nice. The Pedway, the uptown area, it just, it could host people well. And it would be nice to, to kind of build that energy leading up to the event. I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have that energy in June, but it would be nice to be able to build up to it and not have our fans cut back and all that kind of stuff. So it's been challenging that way to, to kind of have that community excitement, but it's, it's kind of always there in the back of your mind and, you know, the city's trying to get behind it as best as they can, but hopefully we can uh, get ahead of this COVID variant uh, and try to open it up and start building the momentum. And I think we will do a good job with whatever we can, but hopefully the team's given the opportunity to really, to really let loose and get the community involved and let the players know how special it is to host a Memorial Cup in your city. I've never been to St. John. I always want to. I'm hoping something goes right here with the Rangers in the next four, four or five months and we can maybe get out there and yeah, we'll, we'll look you up. Uh, 
did you spend a weekend at Doug Gilmore's cottage once? Yeah, I did. Uh, so I'm, I'm good friends with Evan. And I'm sure you guys, I think you guys, I saw he was on the show, right? Yeah, we yeah, had a couple him on, weeks yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, through him, obviously he's married to, to Dougie's daughter. And actually she's from Oakville and knows my brother. They went to high school together. So always kind of knew her a little bit, but you know, then through the wives, they got a little closer and me and Evan played together in Sweden and became close and was fortunate enough to get the invite to Dougie's cottage. And it was pretty nice. Within like five minutes, Kirk Muller's there and you're just, you know, hanging out. I, I love, like, I used to watch, there's this teach me how to Dougie video that got put on YouTube. I used to watch this thing before my games. Like I loved this guy so much to be able to go to his cottage was and just to be around, you know, I'm around him not a lot, but the, the interactions that we do have are more sociable now. And it's, uh, it's pretty fucking awesome to hang out with them. <laughs> <laughs> I got, we were being Evan were we were up to no good late. It was like two, three in the morning. And I just went rummaging through Dougie's cottage. I got, <laughs> leaf pants on i got a winter classic jacket a helmet stick handle with one of his sticks in the living room like just just fanboying at his cottage he was only there for like maybe a couple hours him and his buddy took off back to the city but yeah he's unbelievable what what would seven-year-old stefan legion have said if you had been able to tell him buddy in about 20 years you're going to be at killer's cottage yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I was that big of a fan of his when I was a kid because I never really liked the Leafs. Like, it wasn't, like, always a Dougie thing. It was more of, like, when I got to a high level. And it was like, oh, who do I want to be like? Like, who do I want to play like? Like, who's good? And that's when I started really getting into, like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> you always, I always knew about him. Like, I grew up in Oakville, like, to say I didn't know about how good Doug Gilmore was is I'm not. Yeah, I did. I wasn't obsessed the way I was until I got to the level like the OHL. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try to score a hundred plus points and hip check Bob Probert. Like (laughs) that's what I want to do. I like it. You can definitely see the similarities there, right? A smaller player in stature, but plays with that ferocity, that tenacity, that assholishness, if I can put it that way. And Oh, know. yeah. I mean, that's yeah. it was part of the role, for sure, to be an yeah. asshole. Like, my job was to make 18 guys hate me. 19, because the, goal, like, the goalie was getting it, too. So that was my day. No, but, yeah, I mean, I watched him a lot, and I, I tried to emulate his game. It was, you know uh, – Watched him and Darcy Tucker, Sean Avery. And those were the guys that I wanted to be like. I didn't really care for the points and the goals. Like, I had way more fun getting pulled out of a scrum and was shaving my head into Mohawks all the time in Niagara. Like, I love that stuff. Like, that's what I wanted to be a part of. Like, I thought I might score, but I knew that I was going to get up to some stuff. Like, that's what was fun. Like, I could always control my own level of involvement in the game. And I enjoyed it. So I loved watching Dougie with that way. So I think I asked Evan this. I can't remember if it was him or someone else. But I, I went, got lost in a hockey DB wormhole, which is so easy to do. And I know you were in Syracuse with a guy who I have never met, didn't watch him play, but I know his hockey DB and I love it. John Mike Nasty. Oh. No, John Nasty Morasty. Oh, yeah. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was, what was Morasty like? I don't know. It's hard to describe. Like, like I don't know. He's it's like he was never even there. He's just like a this like living story. Like <laughs> you don't know what's going on. Like yeah, he's got he's stabbed in the arm. He's fighting everyone. He's doing this with the owner. Like it was just you're, you could never keep up with what was going on. I felt like I played on his line for like my whole time in Syracuse which was part of the reason I hated pro hockey so much. Why? I played with this guy. I played with this guy and Kevin Harvey. Like, no offense to Kevin Harvey. He was an all right hockey player, but, like, he was pretty interested in fighting, and Morassi had no interest in anything but fighting, and we never played, and it was just, like, 
So he's, I don't even know how to describe this guy. Like he's something like it's, I don't know. It's like, I can't even put it into words what it's like <laughs> to have played with him. Like, so why was Mike York's name? The first one to come to mind. We mentioned Syracuse. Oh, I don't know. I just thought you were going to, cause he's got an interesting hockey DB. He was a really good player. He was a disaster, but he was a good player. <laughs> Okay. I, I was just wanted to see if I could pull him up on hockey DB here. And I was going to take a look at how interesting his career was. Oh, he was like an Olympian and he had like a zillion points in college. He was good. Was good. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Yeah. You think he says the same thing about Stefan Legion when he gets asked? No clue who I am. <laughs> I'm curious about that. Like how much guys remember you that you were like around a little bit, like, you know, like what is, does Rick Nash remember me from my time in Columbus? Like, you know, oh, those are the weird things I wonder. What do you remember about Rick Nash? He was unbelievable. He was quiet, quiet as anything, but he was so fucking good. <laughs> He was so fast. He was like, if he was the nicest guy, like, you know, just would you know, be at dinner, like, you know, older NHL guys, younger guys, non NHLers like myself, and just, you know, not at fancy places, like hidden at a hotel restaurant, just, you know, just a normal person and incredibly skilled at hockey. Like, he was a treat to watch and he was a treat to be around just watching him be a professional like I had no professional bone in my body but to watch some of those guys that in that NHL level was just that was it that's the coolest part about it for me is to just you know I've seen some of those guys in their element you know Fedorov was in Columbus when I was there and Adam Foote was the captain and Nash and Jaredev and you know Chimera Malhotra you know not like crazy superstars but just some consummate pros that, you know, it's just nice to have watched people that can be so professional and so detailed in their work. And it's nice to have said that I was around them and saw that. And that kind of goes back to what you were saying before. That's, that's kind of the stuff that I, I bring into the players more, I think, than, than my stories is what I've seen of other players and why they've achieved greatness and, that was the best thing you know, really about the NHL for me was to just have, have sat in those guys aura, some of them for a little bit, you know, played games against Mark Recchi, you know, stuff like that. Shea Weber, my first NHL game preseason was against Shea Weber. You know, he went back to aura on me. Like it's, you know, those are the things like, you know, it's, that's all I get from my career. And, those are the stories that I like. And so to, to think about those pros like Nash and, and Fedorov with his new cars every day. And, you know, it's just, it's cool to look back on. Well, on that note, and obviously it was a, a really difficult time of your life, but as a guy who personally like won the Stanley cup, probably a hundred times in his backyard as a kid, but realized that he'd never ever make it to the show. I think of a guy like you, whether you played there or not, second round, 37th overall to the show, is it's pretty damned impressive. But what was what was that moment like? Yeah, that was well, even that was disappointing. Because I thought I was gonna go in the first round for sure. I um, through the relationship with Colin Campbell, I had talked to the Leafs right before the draft started. I was mic'd up with Leaf TV ranked 13th from Toronto, Toronto picked 13th. So thought I was going to go in the first round and then a whole bunch of stuff happened. And it's really tough to get up at like eight o'clock in the morning and put on your suit for Saturday when you were really hopeful for Friday night. <laughs> so I mean, kind of going back into the arena that next morning, it was, it was kind of a drag. If I'm being honest, I wasn't that excited. I was kind of pouty again. I'm, all the stories about me just reek of maturity. So I was obviously handling the situation very well. Um, but then I think that getting drafted by Columbus in Columbus was something that made it, you know, it turned out to be a really special day um, to be able to go down to the dressing room right away and go up to the owner's box and 
you know, meet the whole staff from, you know, soup to nuts, like everyone. A girl worked in the office, I got to meet her. If a guy worked in the parking lot, I got to meet him. Like it was everyone. So it was, it was cool that way. It was nice to be in the city already. We had been to the restaurants and, you know, we'd kind of fallen in love with the city just from being there pre-draft. And, you know, a friend of mine came and we went to Ohio State and we were doing a lot of the pre-draft interviews and stuff around town and going to the various events that the NHL had put on and the Blue Jackets were hosting. So kind of fell in love with the city before and then it was nice to get picked there. So again, it was a kind of a down moment that turned out to, to be a pretty special one when I, I sat back and looked at the big picture of it all. Where, what was that relationship with Cole and Campbell that you've alluded to? He's my parents' neighbor, grandpa's neighbor growing up. Well, I've known him forever. Um, my dad used to go to his hockey school. He taught my dad how to fight, like box wow. in the barn on the punching bag. And um, then I worked with Gregory. I just, Gregory, Colin had a hockey school in Tilsonburg, where my parents are from, where he's from. And uh, Gregory revamped it at a time when I was like world junior. So me, Gregory, Steve Eminger, Carl Stewart, and one of Gregory's sisters, they, well, they started up the hockey school. And then just he, my, my papa passed this year, but he lives like three or four doors down from my papa still. So if I was driving by, I saw his truck. I just pop into the farm and say hello and call him every couple of months to ask for advice. And, you know, it's, it's pretty nice to be able to get the senior VP of the NHL on the phone, whatever yeah. you want, but, um, you know, he's great. Um, you know, my mom's done a lot for his daughters in the business world and he's always been there, you know, never with his hand out, but always with an ear and advice. And it's not always what I want to hear. So that's the main thing that I think is important about the relationship. It's, um, you know, it's, it's always going to be true advice because I don't think he knows how to do it any other way. So he's a good man. I really, I really appreciate what he's able to do for me. And hopefully there's a little bit more in his bag of tricks. He can do some other things for me down the road. You never know, but, you know, it's just nice to have somebody like that in the, in the corner and to have that lifelong connection. Even if I didn't play hockey, I would be able to, to do the same thing with him. So it's nice. When I think back to the teams you played on in the O, uh, Mississauga and Niagara, pretty central uh, in terms of geography, right? And, and Chris and I complain when the long, quote unquote, road trips come to, you know, Sault Ste. Marie or Sudbury here with Kitchener, which again, as central as it gets in the Ontario Hockey League. What's travel like in the queue? Well, ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad. It's not terrible. Like, it's terrible when you come from the O. Like you do some, we do seven days, we do four seven day road trips in Quebec. You know, we got to go pretty far to Gatineau and Blaineville and coming home from Rouen Naranda is like, you play the game at seven, you bus until two, you sleep until 10, you wake up at 10, you get on the bus and you get to St. John at like three in the morning. You know, so it's some, our closest game is an hour and a half. Our second closest is three and a half. Like it's, it's different for sure in that regard. But as a coach, it's nice to have all that kind of free, unabashedful time on a bus to just sit with your thoughts and, you know, get ready for the game. And I'm not going to lie, I sleep on the way to every game. But on the way back, it's nice to have that time to kind of decompress and, you can sit there quietly by yourself and kind of look at the game as a bigger picture. And, you know, it's, it's later nights, but I think that's what the NHL is. I think that's, it's getting me ready to, to work the tough hours and do the trips that are required when you get to pro hockey, because, you know, realistically the next step is from junior is the American league. And it's a lot of bus in there too, I'll tell you. So, you know, you got to get used to, to doing these kind of things and, Coming from the O, it's not something I was used to. And even playing in the American League, I played in Manchester and Syracuse and Adirondack. Um, a lot of our games were three or four hours. We didn't have much of that big travel. So it's, uh, it's a challenge with three kids and 
a wife, but it's nice. It's part of the game. It's just nothing really like rolling into the hotel and throwing your bags on the bed and going down and having a meal with the staff and the players. It's a fun, that's what the best part of junior hockey. It's, you know, it's just being around everyone and in those environments that aren't the same. And anytime you can get out of your home city, I remember in the O we had like maybe four or five of them a year, but man, did we have fun when we went to a hotel. (laughs) And not even just like in the, in like a, you know, party way, but just like, you know, going from room to room, you know, wrestling in the beds, like just, it was just awesome. So to have that and so much, and, you know, obviously as staff, we're not wrestling on the bed, but, you know, we're sitting in one guy's room watching a hockey game on the TV and we're all just talking, you know, shooting the breeze, telling stories. We got a pretty good staff. They've been, They've been around, so there's a lot of uh, interesting stories to be told always, and it's good conversation. It's fun. Like I just, I love the travel aspect. To be honest, my wife hates it. She's in the next room. She's gonna be pissed, but I love it. <laughs> nothing the, like, nothing like it. As if the long season and the travel wasn't bad enough. He's home for one night. We steal him for an hour for a podcast. <laughs> no kidding, your eh? poor wife. Well, I've been home for like three weeks straight. My wife's been getting. Oh, so she's ready for the next road trip. Oh, COVID is just kind of, she's been spoiled in a sense that last year we played 35 games, was home forever. And then just being a coach or around all summer, like she's a teacher. She ain't going anywhere either. So yeah. we're just, I'm always around. So she's spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm checking, you know. Yeah. Checking. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, how was your time in Sweden? awful <laughs> was it yeah yeah I guess, yeah like a lot of my experiences were bad truthfully like there's a lot of good guys like but the hockey side of it like it just wasn't good for me i came in late they had their guys established dark all the time defensive style big guys i speared some guy in my first game and got a five and got kicked like you just didn't start good and then if it doesn't start well with the imports are so valuable to them. Like it's a business. I get it. Like looking at it now again, I'm the dick, (laughs) but it just, I I wish, you know, I wish I did more with it a little bit now. Like I had some good times when my wife came over and, you know, dinners with the guys and stuff like that. I wasn't, but I was in a pretty bad play. And that was when you you go over to Europe for the first time, you're kind of like, well, there goes my dreams. I'm out of here. Especially the second league in Sweden. It ain't like it's the, uh, our captain was a cop. Like you got other guys that work at the Audi dealership. It's just a different situation. So I didn't handle it that great. It was, I had a lot of depression because it was dark. It's, it's a challenge. It's, you know, you think you're just going to go over and do well because you did well over here. But if you don't adapt to the lifestyle, if you don't, you know, buy into the lifestyle. And I tried to be North American in Sweden. Like I needed to be Swedish in Sweden. Like, so, you know, it's, it could have been very fun. I can see why people have such a good time. I know I, you talked to Evan, he spent so long over there and loved it. And his wife loved it. And sure they had hard times, but most of it was good. And I wish that more of it was good for me. I was only there for a short time, but it's unfortunate. I, but I still did have a lot of good away from hockey. I love Stockholm. I love traveling around. I went to see Evan actually for Christmas that year in Gothenburg. And so that was nice. And it was, there there was fun times to it, but all when you're over there, it all leads back to the hockey and the hockey was miserable for me. I wasn't playing well. I wasn't received, received well by the team and not the players didn't like me, but just uh, I didn't gel with the group and I didn't do well. And, just an on ice nightmare is similar to everything that happened to me when I started getting paid to play. I gotta be perfectly honest. I, I truly admire the accountability with the I'm a dick stories and, and the perspective that you have now. But I, I do wonder, Stefan, given where we are at and by we, I mean a collective, we as society and, and the game and how much more willing we are to talk openly about, you just use the word depression, right? Anxiety, depression 
could it have been different 20 years ago, 15 years ago for you? I think so. But just because you talk about stuff, it doesn't make it better necessarily. Like, you know, I talk to my close friends in Niagara about stuff all the time. And like, you know, we had those 5 a.m. chats where we're just finished tonight and we're just sitting there kind of the two or three of us. And we've had those conversations. It's just, I don't know if it just because you talk about it, it definitely helps. I'm not going to say don't talk about it because you got to talk about it. But I don't know if just because people would have, like, it wasn't necessarily performing either. Like there's, it's a performance based industry. Like you could really, if you're performing well, you can get away with a lot. And I think that's where a lot of guys, you know, the, oh, they didn't understand my anxiety. They didn't under, well, they did, but it's just a business and you weren't performing. And that's the sad side of it. And so I don't know if, you know, I had conversations with people in my organizations about it as well and you know, didn't really seem to care because I wasn't that good. And it's just, I get it. Like, I get it. If I owned something, I would not, it'd be hard to care about anything but the bottom line when that's what feeds your family. And, you know, so they made their choices trying to further their careers and it didn't further mine. And I can't blame them for that because I would do the same thing. That's wild that you can view it like that after everything you've been through, but it's crazy to, it's, it's nice hearing you describe it that way. Cause I never would have thought of it that way. Yeah. Like I said, once you've done it, like there's no really, there's no going back, Like there's no rewind button once you've made a choice. So I 33, I made that choice when I was 19 and I've, everything from then is kind of had a lot of time to sit back with, you know, the decision and, there's not really any many other perspectives you can get to when you really break it down. Other than that, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's just, that's life. How many people are in life fair for? So that's very fair. So you know? do you look at the goal now, Stefan, as being accomplishing in hockey hall of fame career, Stanley cup as a coach that you weren't able to do as a player? Yeah, that would like that's that's what I wake up trying to do. That's what I go to work for. That's what I want. That's my goal. You know, hopefully, I obviously know it's going to take time. Coaching isn't like playing. You can't have a good four year junior career and then just be in the the next level. There's guys who have been doing this for 25, 30 years every day. So, you know, I just got to keep my head down and hope for my opportunity. But that would be the ultimate feather in the cap for me would be to to be able to ice some Stanley Cups and maybe end up in the Hall of Fame but at the the end of the day it's just to get to that level that I I missed out as a player and I know that I'm I'm going to be there as something Um, I'm just hoping that it's it's coaching and and that's that's it you know that's that's what it is it's like it's like all of us that work in hockey we're trying to get to that the top level and you know we talked about best on best before that's what the nhl is every night really it's it's the best of the best going at it so that's where i want to be i i know we gotta let you go i'll just ask one final question here real quick you ended your career playing in tulsa what is, was the best yeah. thing to come out of your time with the tulsa oilers my dog there we go <laughs> How's the, oh, there, oh, oh there that's fantastic. Tulsa. That's fantastic. That's, that's awesome. That's it. That's the thing that got me through the first year. So my wife would go to work and it would just be me and this dog at home all day. <laughs> she would be there after every practice. She was great. I, I asked the guys in Manchester to trade me somewhere warm. I got a dog right away and I enjoyed my last few weeks as a hockey player. <laughs> That's amazing. Great, great way to I, round it out. I didn't catch. I couldn't tell from the quick glance. What kind of dog is she? She is a boxer mix. She's from Tulsa, so she's probably a pit bull. <laughs> I thought I saw the brindle markings because I have a boxer oh, yeah, husky mix. Yeah. Yeah, she's brindle as they cut. She's not like, you know, very. She doesn't have like full pit bull. She looks more like a. I don't know. 
she's got that uh that southern united states look to a dog that most have but she's sweet as anything like i said i have three kids she's there in her face all day she's awesome when i'd she let was... her babysit if they would wouldn't put me in jail for it <laughs> <laughs> when she was younger was she a good pup or was she a dick she was the best <laughs> the first day we got her at four months she uh she had like, one accident in the house during and we left her for i had to go to a game so there's nothing i could have done i don't believe in crates so i'd let i let her wander but i would put like i had a pair of yeezy shoes i would leave them out she would be at home while i was at practice never touched anything that wasn't hers she's just respectful dog like just that's the best way i can describe her is respectful Good she knows fantastic. what's hers and she respects what's not hers. Absolutely. Like love it. it. This, this has been a great conversation. It's it's really great to catch up with you. Good luck with the Sea Dogs and the Memorial Cup. Let's uh, get that redemption you talked about, man. And uh, best of luck Hopefully. moving forward. Thanks, guys. It was great chatting as well.